<laughs> hello, hello, hello. What's going on? Uh, welcome to the Authentic You podcast where your emotional and spiritual health matters. Matters, M-A-T-T-E-R-S. And like I said before, because once again, Renee forgot to hit the record button. This is the problem with recording only every other week. My brain just forgets. I think last <laughs> time you forgot to hit the record. Or no, no, the, the first before one. that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm anyway. Anyway, who are you? Who am I? Yeah. I'm, a, I'm a rad dad, apparently. <laughs> Some, they brought me, co- Anthony Jen brought me coffee in a rad dad cup. So I'm repping dads and moms today. You're also Pastor Stacey Huckleberry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hi. <laughs> I am Stacey. How are you? And I'm here with Renee Mora. Um, I do want to address the aggressive matters that happens once in a while. Oh, yeah. When I am saying hello. Sometimes I don't do this on purpose. It's just there is nappy nap time sometimes (laughs) in my brain that happens. Um, But sometimes I forget to say or add the S on the word matters where your emotional and spiritual health matters. Yes. And so I do that so I don't annoy you. It's not really an annoyance. (laughs) But you get me. I try to like give you these eyes and like drill it into your face without saying it matters. I know how to speak English. I know you do. I just, I don't know if I care sometimes. <laughs> Matter, matters, whatever. Um, anyway, this is session three um, of our podcast, season two. I'm excited. Yes. We're back. Kind of. it's took it, it's taken us a minute to um I said took in help. See um, <laughs> you're rubbing off on me. <laughs> <laughs> it's taken a minute for us to get rolling mm-hmm. because we had our little illness situation, but we're back and on schedule now. There was not a little illness situation, right. near death experiences. <laughs> but we're better now. Like it's I had a nurse come to Lord. my house, Renee, take my That's vitals. True. Took my vitals, <laughs> make sure I was breathing. Oh gosh. I was so sick. Renee was really sick. A lot of people were very sick. And I don't even think my body has fully recovered because I'm really tired all the time. Mm-hmm. So anyway. So um this week, well, this past uh couple of weeks, we were we are a church, so authentic church out in Winter Springs, Florida. So Central Florida area. We do series. Uh, pretty much, you know, every three, four weeks. And so we just ended our series, um, love story. No, I'm sorry. That was the, what I preached first love. And I preached love story this past Sunday. And I think for the first time at our church, I gave a little bit of my testimony and how I encountered or the time I encountered the Lord or when I encountered the Lord for the first time. So that was the first Actually, this is the first time in church on a Sunday morning I've ever done it. Mm-hmm. Not yeah. in a private space with anyone. Right. So. I think there was one other time where you gave a little bit. <clears throat> um, but yeah, that's not that's not usually your go-to in on a Sunday morning. No. Well, I probably day to day. <laughs> okay. I was giving you an out. <laughs> <laughs> No, but um, so backing up a little bit, the first love series Mm -hmm. that we just have some context, like to tell us in general what that series was about. Yeah, so it was three weeks. um, And the first week was about how in any relationship, if, you know, we don't make the effort or we don't uh, spend time in that relationship, invest in that relationship, then things can kind of dwindle away. That fire can, and all married couple, couples can attest to this, you know, that fiery feeling that you had in the beginning, you know, when you're dating and then that honeymoon period, you know, as life goes on, you know, that's not reality, right? And so you have to put in the work, you have to invest in that relationship. So it's, what does it look like to go back to our first love? And it wasn't about a romantic relationship, but our first love being Jesus, right? you know, because a lot of people um, that have known the Lord for a significant amount of time, you know, we've experienced that kind of lull sometimes in our relationship. And so it was an encouragement and, 
you know, an awakening, like, hey, let's awaken that love again. Right. You know, our first love, which is Jesus. Right. You know, what does that look like? <clears throat> Tangibly, too. So it's not just love Jesus more. But what does that look like on a day-to-day basis, right? And then last week, oh, I'm sorry, two weeks ago, my husband gave his testimony, actually. Mm-hmm. And he, maybe one day we'll have him on the podcast to give his testimony. It's It's pretty... It's pretty incredible. He actually, he didn't mention this on Sunday because we just don't have a lot of time on a Sunday morning. But he had a series of dreams right before he gave his life to God. So dedicating his life to Jesus, right? He was on this, I forgot what drug he was on. He was just out of his mind on drugs. And he ended up at his brother's house on the couch. And I think it was for about five days. I don't remember all the details. Um, But he had a dream every night that, so the first night was pretty intense, pretty dark. And then the next night when he went to sleep, the second dream just was kind of a continuation of the first and then the third and the fourth. And then the fifth night or sixth night, whatever, Jesus entered his dream and said, this is your last chance. Wow. Yeah. In the dream. It's like, this is it. And so what do you yeah, do? Right. There's a lot more details to that, but that'd be a cool story for him too. Absolutely. It's just that that whole week of dreams is like oh my God, a little yeah. revelation there yeah. in the Bible. So um and then so last week I gave uh, my testimony and um my encounter with Jesus and mm-hmm. what what that looked like, what that felt like, and what that decision to to give my life to Jesus what that looks like now, 20 years later. Right. Yeah. And we'll, we'll get into that in a second. I, <clears throat> in case anybody's thinking, okay, so you're doing this series on first love and then how does your personal testimony then come into it? You know, but there is that when you first meet Jesus and it's so much and everything. Yeah. Um, but the idea of maintaining that passion of first love with the Lord is not just a good idea, right? You started the first week with um, scripture from Revelation 2 about Jesus talking to the church at Ephesus and saying, I hold this against you. Even though you've done all of these amazing things, I hold this against you that you have lost your first love. Yeah, And that is, again, not just a good idea, but also a warning. Yeah, You know, if you were in a, if your marriage is in a state where they're checking all the boxes, but there's no love. Yeah. That's something no one's signing up for. No. I <clears> hope. <throat> no, no one's signing up for it. You good? I think so. <laughs> you were crashing there. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to hold it together. <laughs> yeah. But I, you know, we've been friends for a long time. and um, But there were things in how you shared your testimony I don't think you and I have ever sat down and you just like told me your testimony from start to start to finish. Like I've gathered pieces of it over the years. That might be on me. (laughs) I never sat down and you said, tell me your testimony. But there's a reason for that because you are not one that's like. Yeah. A newspaper. I'm not a newspaper. So. um, I'd rather be sit in the back. Yeah. Private. (laughs) So there were things that you shared. And in, in the way that you shared it on Sunday, there were things that I hadn't heard before, um, which I was sitting there like, oh, wow, she's going there, <laughs> you know. But you had to choose, and, and I want you to like go ahead and tell it here <clears throat> too, but before you do, why? what goes into choosing on a Sunday morning how much of your story you're going to tell. And then why do you make certain like editorial choices? You yeah. Know, more than just the time constraint. Yeah. So the night before, um, I was going to preach. So that was Saturday night. I had a bunch of notes on all the things, right. That I experienced pre Jesus. And when I was looking at it, <clears throat> I was like, Lord, I do not want 
to share these things just for the <gasps> factor. Mm -hmm. um, I you, you can have that. I don't care about the all factor in church. Like she right. did that. Whoa, that's my pastor. Oh my God. You know, she came. I don't want that. Anything that I say or anything that I share, the goal is to, um, I want to edify people, but I also want to not make it about me. Right. I do not want to make it about me. There are times when I have heard people share their testimony and it has been 35 minutes of their testimony and of what they used to be before encountering Jesus. And then a three minute wrap up, you know, he came and he saved me. Mm -hmm. I just, I don't, I don't like that. So that's why I take a lot of time um, in prayer and, okay, hey, what do you want me to say, Lord? Because the goal is that everyone in this room would encounter you. And so how do I die to self? How do I make you known? And if you want me to go there, which this is hard for me to break, if you want me to go there, I will. I just need you to prepare me overnight. Right. To, to say it. Mm -hmm. because there are parts of my testimony actually that not even my parents know yet. Right. Which is fine. I'm old enough now <laughs> if they listen to this and they give me a call, I'm like, let's sit down. But <clears throat> there are parts that there, my husband doesn't even know. And it's not because I didn't, I was keeping this away or I was keeping this from him. It's just, it never, it wasn't a thing. And there were these deep, dark things that never really came up. Um, and my husband's very like, I love you now and <laughs> protect me from anything. <laughs> I love you. 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 <clears throat> so, um, I'm, I'm, I'm cautious because I don't want to make, I want to make Jesus known. I don't want myself to be known right? or make myself known. I don't want uh, someone to leave the room saying, oh my God, Pastor Stacey has such a rough life, but I want people to leave the room saying, I want to encounter that Jesus she just talked about. Right. That's really important to me. Yeah. So I think too, like there's a real drawback to, and that's probably too light of a word for it, but a real drawback to like sensationalizing our testimony. Mm -hmm. um, for one thing, it's unnecessary um, because all sin separates us from God. Yep. So if your issue is 100 on a scale of 100 or one, yeah. separation is separation. So you, there's a risk, I suppose, of um, the person that's a one being like, well, I mean, I'm not, I'm not a 100. My gosh, yeah. she definitely needed Jesus. You yeah. know, I'm like, I'm doing fine. Yeah. Um, and I've known people like that who were like, no, my life is good. Like I'm a good person. That's the danger that you fall into yeah. when, we, when we over, I don't want to say overblow because it's not like the things aren't real, but to emphasize them in such a way that it can feel exclusionary yeah. to other people. Um, besides the bigger issue of pointing away from Jesus and towards your big story. Um, but I, th I felt like you did such a, a, a wonderful job of the things that you said, they weren't very specific, but I think that made them relatable, mm -hmm. right? Because um, you talked about loneliness, okay? And some of the things you did to, to um, or involved yourself in to satisfy that loneliness. Yeah. The specifics of what you did might not be relatable to every person sitting in that room. Yeah. Yet the feeling of loneliness is very relatable. Yes. And so I thought that was very um, beautifully done. Um, you know, not to sit here and be like, wow, but, but that, I think that's, and that's what I hope for. Yeah. But I think that's important for people to know because we are supposed to share our, our testimony. With yes. People, right. And, um, and we shouldn't be, um, walking in that blindly, like it should be something that we have considered, right? And thought about, I feel like, and thought about how am I going to tell this story in a way that points to Jesus and blesses the people around me and yeah. ministers to them. 
That is the goal. Right. You know, um, we have a lot of people out here, preachers, pastors, and I'll just say it. I mean, I see it all over social media that like the attention on them. And that is a prayer that I actually pray consistently. God, forever keep me at your feet and humble. Mm -hmm. um, because I never want to make this about me. And I'm human and I can. Sure. I'm fully capable, 100% capable of making this about me. And I, I don't want, help me to always remember that moment that I met you. Because it was in that moment I met you there was something mm -hmm. that happened. There was a, okay, it's, it's the two of us now, Stacey. Right. And I always want to remember that, just the two of us. And if that moment can bring others to Jesus, then I would, I, I want to use that, that moment. So, you know, it's been, okay, I used to work for, a ministry years ago, it's a nonprofit. It was like a girl's home. And there was like a lot of, <clears throat> they had uh, girls that had gone through abuse, physical, sexual abuse. Um, they had addictions, meth addictions, drug, alcohol. I mean, these poor babies, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 mm -hmm. year olds, right? They know more about me. Those girls years ago, they know more about me than I think anyone on the planet. Wow. <clears throat> so, because I would sit with them and say, hey, I understand the why behind why you chose to do that or sleep with this person or take this drug or self-medicate or cut or mm -hmm. whatever. And I would use the things that I went through in detail to show them the goodness of God. Right. Hey, look what God can do. And so I, I had to, I would, there were times where I had to sit with people, these girls and say, Hey, I've, I know what it feels like to be offered the back seat, And that's what you choose all the time. Mm. Because that's, that's, that's all you feel that you, that's your worth. Right? right. And so, but to say that on a Sunday morning, I mean, in detail for, for what, <laughs> right. you know, um, but I'm, 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 I asked the Lord, you know, Lord, use, use me, use my testimony, use that moment and whatever you need me to do, you know, I will do it. I will say what I need to say to people. I will let people into these dark spaces. Um, and it's not that I don't want, no, that's a lie. Hold on. I'm going to press on that. I might be lying there. Maybe not. It's not that I, I don't want people to know just because I, I'm private, leave me alone. But it's, um, I like the woman that I am now. I love the relationship I have with the Lord. I love our relationship. And I like to stay there. Right. So I don't like to go back. Um, and it's not because, well, I don't want to deal with the stuff or I've already dealt with that stuff. I looked at those monsters in the face and said, oh, you don't, you don't control me anymore. But I just, that's just over there. And I just, I like sitting with the Lord now. And mm -hmm. so Renee, I'm fully aware of that, you know, God will use me to share parts of my testimony um, to help someone else out of darkness. Yeah. You know, that we may have shared the same darkness. Right. My darkness and your darkness are two different darknesses, but they're the same feeling of hopelessness. And loneliness, mm -hmm. and like you were, like you mentioned. Right. You know, um, <clears throat> hold on. Cause I lost my train of thought. This will be edited. That's okay. Cause I just took a massive <laughs> of coffee. <laughs> All right. We're pausing for a second. Yeah. Do you, I, I, I feel this way, but I don't know that it's like <clears throat> a proven thing, but I think it is. Um, <laughs> I do feel that whatever the Lord does for us, he does because he loves us as an individual. Mm -hmm. But I feel that everything that he does for us is always for the, a benefit beyond us. Mm -hmm. And so that, I, I guess I want you to speak to that a little bit. Like, 
it's our our story, right? And we should be, um, I don't want to say careful, but like we should honor our story. Absolutely. Um, but we can't like hide it away either. Yeah, I'm gonna pull this up. Uh, the scripture. Um, it's in Genesis. I don't want to butcher it. So give me a second. You don't have to edit this. It'll be all right. Sip on your coffee. I'm definitely going to. <laughs> it's so ridiculous. <laughs> um, it's not pulling up. What is going on with my phone? Anyway, it's about um, Genesis. I believe it's 5020. I believe. Um, but it just talks about what the enemy you know, meant to destroy, mm -hmm. you know, Joseph in the Bible. You know, God can use it for good and he will use it. But there's a, there's like the second part to that where it says for the saving of many lives. Yes. Which that is, I, that will probably be my favorite verse of all time. It's that second part for the saving of many lives. Because it's beyond me. It goes beyond yes. uh, me. Is it Genesis 50, 20? It is. You 21? intended you yeah. in 50 to 20, uh, 50 verse 20. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Yeah. And this is, this is Joseph's story. If you don't know the story of Joseph, um, it's a I, I love that story. Yeah. Um, Cause you, you can just see God all through that. Um, but yeah, that, it, it's not about us. Right. You know, and like you said, he loves us. Absolutely. He loves all his children. And if he can use our story, because he didn't cause the crap that we, <laughs> you know what I mean? We chose our sin. We chose to deny him. We chose to walk into these spaces. And, you know, even sometimes, you know, the things that we think, well, I didn't, I didn't choose that. Well, no, we all have a choice, Right. And so, but to be clear, you're not talking about things that other people did. Right. No, 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 no. no, no. no. You're talking about the things that we do have I'm talking about our choices. For, yeah, yeah, yeah. Our choices. Um, that's, we have chosen that. Right. And so he, I love that verse so much because my story doesn't end. Um, it keeps going. And so like my story, 20 something years ago, I met the Lord. I just shared my story on a Sunday morning and I got a couple of text messages of people from people in our church that said, thank you for showing me how Jesus loves. Mm -hmm. Like, just thank you. That's right. like a different, that right there for the saving of many lives, mm -hmm. for the saving of, now yeah. that person can encounter Jesus and then pass that down to their daughter, yeah, to their yeah. son, to the, whatever, you know, right. to their neighbor. And it goes, it's not about me. So that moment, 20 something years ago where I met Jesus, he's like, okay, I'm good. That moment, it's going to have repercussions. It's just, right? Repercussions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. repercussions. It's going to have a ripple effect. That's what I wanted to say. Yeah. And it's just going to go from generation to generation to generation because of the moment that I chose to acknowledge that Jesus was sitting with me, mm -hmm. you know? Um, like uh, the story that I shared this Sunday from John four, the woman at the well. I love that story. And I can relate to her probably she's probably the one that I can relate to in the Bible. Mm -hmm. Um, and if you don't know that story, we have enough time, right? Sure. Okay. Make sure. Um, <laughs> if you don't know that story, this, it's a woman who encountered Jesus, but Jesus knew everything about her and she she had several husbands and the man that she was with at the time was wasn't her husband and so there was a there's a lot of um you can tell she was looking for something you know and she just hence the many relationships and and so um I love the Samaritan woman because I feel like I have I was the Samaritan woman just very like a castaway, uh, you know, looking for love in all the wrong places, trying to fulfill an emptiness that 
I finally found in Jesus. And the moment the Samaritan woman met Jesus, she finally was able to fill that void. Like, mm-hmm. wait a second. None of these men were going to fill this emptiness that I, I feel, that I have, the void that I have. But it was when she encountered Jesus at the well when she was, you know, getting water and Jesus asks her for water. And he says, I have water that is greater than this water that you're drinking here. I've got, I'm, I've got the living water, right. you know, which is eternal life. And, you know, there's a part in, there's a part in that story where she, she's kind of like, yeah, okay, <laughs> sure, whatever. And, you know, he's trying, slowly trying to reveal himself to her and she's just not getting it, you know. Um, and I, I can relate to sometimes like Jesus is right there and we yeah. just kind of not see him. You know, mm-hmm. she obviously she finally once he he reads her mail and then tells her, hey, I, I am he, the one you guys have been talking about. I'm, I'm here. Yeah, I'm, I'm the one. Um, and she encounters him. She encounters him and then does something that I did when I gave my life to the Lord. Scripture says that she went and told people about Jesus. Like he's he, he's there. You got to meet this man that just told me everything about me. Mm-hmm. Right. And then Jesus spends some time there and people get saved, come to know who he is, accept him. Right. And that's what I did when I first gave my life to the Lord. Once I knew, oh my God, this is real. <laughs> this is like a <laughs> thing. I was telling everyone about Jesus. Every, you could not, I was probably annoying. You could not have a conversation. And I didn't mention this on a Sunday. You could not have a conversation with me without me saying, do you know Jesus? If you don't, you're going to know him. We got five minutes. Cool. And I would always, I mean, everywhere I went, there was this one time I, (laughs) I was annoying. This is annoying. Um, I was leaving church and I was hyped. I don't even know what the sermon was about, but I was like fire. Oh, it was like a revival night or something in, in like the young adults ministry. And I went and hopped in my car. I had a 1987 no, I was in my Honda, 96 Honda, and I'm driving down the road back to my house and there I'm playing worship music and a car, a truck load of like dudes pulls up next to me and they're jamming to some kind of God awful music. I can't remember. And I, <laughs> I roll down the window. I'm like, hey, 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 hey. And they roll down the win- windows. They're like, what's up? Do any of you know who Jesus is? <laughs> and they're like, oh, uh, I'm like. Can you pull over? I want, I want to tell you what Jesus is. Stacy. Like, no. I did. I, but I didn't care. Yeah. I was like, no, you, you cannot not know Jesus because I encountered him. Don't you want this? Right. Because you can't, someone can tell me, well, Jesus isn't real. Okay. Well, you can have that, but you can never take away the moment that I met him. Mm-hmm. Like you can't, you can't fi- fight me on that. I'll fight you. But you can't fight me right. on that. That's truth. And so I wanted to tell everyone. So it's like, I've, feel for the, I love the Samaritan woman because I feel I was her like, oh my God, he read my, he, and he still wanted to sit with me. He knew all the men that she was with and the man that she was sleeping with at the time. Like she, he knew all that and yet said, I, I still love you. I still have a plan for you. I still, you're still loved right. and wanted. That's, I had never heard those words from any human being. Yeah. I want to ask you more about if there's anything else you want to share here, because we were talking before we started about, um, because I was saying, oh, you mentioned things I, in all these years that we've been friends, there were things I hadn't heard. Yeah. Um, And you were talking about different, different stories for different spaces. Mm Mm-hmm. Right. So this is a different space here Mm -hmm. than a Sunday morning. Um, But you said something on Sunday that it kind of stuck with me. Uh, You were talking about how when you met Jesus, you discovered a love that was not going to be angry with me, a love that wasn't prideful. All these Mm -hmm. things that were, you know, 1 Corinthians 13. Thank you for picking, so beautifully picking up on that. Yeah, I was like, ooh, I like that. Um, 
But you said this statement, you said, I found somebody who would love me out of darkness. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, wow. Mm -hmm. That's so profound and so true for all of us, whatever our darkness looks like. Whatever. Right. So I I wanted to kind of use that as a jumping off point for you for whatever you wanted to share here about your testimony. Maybe, um, you know, because you didn't have a lot of time Sunday. Mm Mm-mm. But you you mentioned that you were to the, that your okay Jesus moment was basically like, I got nothing left to try but you. Yeah. You know, which is not the most romantic <laughs> approach, the no. most spiritual approach to Lord come into my life. You know. Yeah. Um, to say I got you're my last ditch effort. Yeah, and yet he still says okay. Yeah. Like. Imagine me going into a relationship with some guy like, hey, you're the other dudes didn't work out. I guess I'll try you. <laughs> what? Right. Um, but yet even in my response, God still accepted that response. Like, I'll try you. Like, okay. I mean, in a way, it's a place. The first part of that is the place we all have to really get to anyways, which is. I got nothing left. Yeah. All my attempts, all the things I've been grasping at are falling short. Like yeah. we all have to get to the end. Yeah. Right. You were just mad blunt about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was, um, yes, I was blunt and I was serious. Like that was a real feeling that was <clears throat> inside of me because, um, I think I mentioned this. I said that, you know, I, I, went from room to room looking for fulfillment, Mm -hmm. trying to self-medicate. And what I meant um, by that was I I have a great father. I have a great father. He's a hardworking man, and we've discussed this. He loves his kids. He loves his grandkids. He's literally the most perfect grandfather on earth. He's so good. Um, he did, however, uh, work so much that he was pretty much non-existent in my life. So growing up, I would see him not on a regular, so he was always working. So it wasn't like he was out slinging dope. Right. (laughs) Right. He's just really trying to make a life for his family because he came from poverty. He came from homelessness. He came from living, you know, living on the streets and, just a lot of stuff, um, you know, poverty, that that kind of thing is is in our family, yeah. right? And so he really was working hard to make sure that the next generation didn't have to experience that. Um, but we, little girls need their dad. They need their dad to um, protect them and they need their dad to show them what a good guy looks like and when to say no and to say, you know, that's okay, whatever. Make it they need their dad to um, keep them safe from the big bad wolf out in the world, right? Mm-hmm. And so he would die for his family. But work kept him away from being aware of yeah. what was happening in the home, specifically with me. And so with me... I desired to be with my dad. I desired, which most little girls, unfortunately, if, if dads are non-existent or they sucky fathers, man, that does that does a number on on children. But I desired that. And I ended up, instead of learning how to make the right choices, I ended up fulfilling that need by going from relationship to relationship, right? And they were not... They were not good relationships. Um, But I had no one to talk to or share. Like my mom didn't grow up talking to her parents. Right. My mom didn't grow up saying, hey, how do you feel? How are you processing this? Can I help? It wasn't like that. I mean, I remember one time I cried over a boyfriend that we, you know, we broke up. And the first thing my mom said was, well, did you sleep with him? Because if you did, that's your problem. 
Mm. And so it was that kind of like, I had no outlet. I had no one. I didn't have a safe space. And it's not that they purposely did it. They just didn't have that to give. Yeah. They didn't know. Right. And so I, I, I'm very much like the Samaritan woman where it's, you got five dudes and right. <laughs> the guy that you're with is not even the one, you know? Um, so I ended up in saying yes to relationships, being in relationships with guys, you know, men that just wanted to take from me. But in the moment I felt like, okay, I feel good in this moment, but I always felt like garbage after. Sure. And so, um, you know, I mean, I, I think it was 13 years old. Um, I, unfortunately, 14, unfortunately, it's like two years older, a year older than my daughter now, you know, ended up being manipulated to get in the backseat of a car mm. and like lose my virginity in the backseat of a car. That's the forever memory that I have. Right. And it was horrible. It was brutal. It was, uh, I could still see it and it makes me sick. Um, but I remember, but this is what I want to feel good. I want to feel like someone wants me or needs me or, you know, loves me or whatever. And it just, I kept doing it because I thought this is how you should function, right? This is how relationships are. You give, you give, you give, you give. And it just always left me feeling so lonely and eventually led me to spaces of like dark thoughts and suicidal thoughts. And um, I did mention briefly that I was even hospitalized for having, um, you know, for, for even saying <laughs> that I was going to um, harm myself. I got into, I mean, I had the police called on me one time because I had, um, my parents didn't know what to do with me, but I was so far gone in my head. I could not, I didn't know what right and wrong was. And, um, instead of sitting with me and keeping me safe, it was more, you know, we got to fix this problem. So I got arrested, was taken to the hospital and I stayed there for several days. And I remember I was in, um, it's what you call Baker acted. I think that's what they call yeah. it here in Florida. So I was Baker acted, um, how old were you at this point? Uh, I think maybe 16. Mm. So I was Baker acted. And I remember sitting in, so you got, so you're in a room, right? And there's two beds and they're like metal beds with like no sheets on them. Right. So you got one person over here, another girl, and then me. And then there's a window, one window. And it was over my bed that I was sleeping in and it had bars but you can see the city and it's like really dark in the room. And I remember feeling, I didn't know Jesus, but I remember feeling this, I'm not supposed to be here. Mm -hmm. Why am I in a padded cell right now, looking out at the world, feeling like absolute trash. There is a, and if you've never experienced this, or if you have experienced this, you know what I'm talking about such a deep loneliness and desire to feel safe and wanted and yet nothing. It makes you sick. It makes your palms like sweaty and clammy and you just feel lost. And so when you get to that, especially being so young, you just want to jump out of a window and give up. It's like, um, I'm actually good. I, Nothing's going to change over here. Right. So, and I, and the people that loved me, you just threw me away because you couldn't handle me. So just go into this padded room with a girl that's smashing her head on the railing mm. and screaming. And I'm sitting there like, what is happening? And I was there for a little bit. And, but I always remembered feeling like this is not this is not what my life is supposed to be like but yet why am I here I don't understand this so I leave um and there's this major tension in my home because if you don't have it to give how in the world can you save someone right <laughs> you don't have it to give so there was a lot of we're not talking about it let's figure this out <laughs> quietly or not, you know, right. Or I do come from a family of like, um, which I love this because this has helped me in my walk with the Lord. Like we don't lay down and just cry all day. 
right. like get up and go. But I did need to lay down and cry. I yeah. mean, did need to, I did need moments of like going in the corner and saying, I'm just, I don't feel safe. I feel uncomfortable. I'm looking for something, um, a love. And I just, I'm finding it in all these different spaces. Um, and with my choices in relationships, <laughs> it just got worse and worse and worse. You know, I ended up with, in a, with a gang member who I actually was looking at pictures of, um, I will not say this, some pictures of an event that we were at. And I remember last week when I was looking, when I was looking through pictures um, before I preached on Sunday, I was just looking at old stuff. And I was so angry at some of the pictures that I found. I was like, oh my God, I didn't even know I had this, but it was, I'll say it, whatever. It was like my prom. Mm -hmm. And I remember I hated my, my prom. Like I hated it because the, when you're in a gang, and you have a boyfriend in the gang, like that you are property. And so you are somewhat controlled and this person was in jail. And so I had to be controlled while he was away. Um, try that now. <laughs> I'm not that, no. I'm not the one now, but <laughs> back then I just, whatever, I submitted to it. And um, there was such a, manipulative way about the whole situation. Um, but I, I, I looked at my prom pictures and I was like sick to my stomach. And then I felt so bad for the girl that I was looking, mm. I was looking at in the pictures like, Oh, you poor thing. I remember how horrible you felt. You were made to go with the brother of your boyfriend because the brother had to watch you at prom to make sure that you weren't doing anything wrong and so I had no fun on my prom like that's that right. should be like your, a really great moment so I, it was horrible I en ended up going home that night yeah <laughs> not having fun not going to party and whatever right. and just feeling lonely horrible because I had to wait for this guy to come out of jail and I needed to make sure I was had all my ducks in a row is that you posted a picture on your social media Saturday mm -hmm. night is that was that picture from prom that one, it was probably a, senior year. A caption of yeah, probably senior year. Talking to this girl, absolutely, yeah, probably senior year. Because that senior year was like, I don't, I don't know, I'm gonna come out of this. Mm -hmm. Um, and I hung out with an older crew, so my I wasn't chilling with 15 year olds. It was 20, 30 year olds. It was I was in a life, right? <laughs> um, anyway, I didn't know better to say no to the people that were hurting me. I felt safety was um, people having my back in a fight or people having my back when, or being jealous if I talk to another guy, like, mm -hmm. oh, they, they love me because they're jealous. And it was just a perverted way of, of love. And it was just gross. Anyway, I finally, this guy finally gets out of jail and, um, it was horrible. He, we broke up like two weeks after that, after I waited an entire year because rumor was it, ru rumor had it that I was around town doing some stuff, mm -hmm. um, which was true, but they, he found out and he's like, well, I can't, I can't be with someone like that. And I'm like, what the? my whole life has been miserable for the last year and you just, right. You, you What? <laughs> you mm -hmm. know? Um, and his family hated me. It was horrible. Uh, it was just a horrible situation. Anyway, I was so broken that that relationship ended. So, so broken. That relationship is what brought me to my room where my friend. Yes. Um, said, Hey, do you want to go to church? shared that on Sunday it was like I'm so done nothing I do is right mm. every guy I'm in a relationship with it's just I don't feel safe I'm protected you know this is horrible I also had a best friend at the time who turned her back on me and went with the family and went with my boyfriend and she was actually the snitch mm. that snitched on me that I was with another guy so my best friend right um turned her back on me so it's just like what <laughs> There's no one good in my life. This really sucks. Anyway, I give my life to the Lord. 
It was an incredible, incredible experience. How old were you now? Um, so this was after, so this was after high school graduation. So I probably was at college. So I don't know, 18. Yeah. First year of college. Um, yeah. And so I, and in my home, it's like, you gotta, you gotta work. You you can't just be lazy. (laughs) Like go do your life. You can't just be living in this house. Right. That's just how my family raised me, right? Um, so I didn't know what to do in my life. I knew, like, I have no friends. Well, who I thought were my best friends just, like, totally turned on me. I got no, I thought I was going to marry this guy. I don't really, I don't have really good intimate relationships with people in my family. So it's, it was just a struggle. I end up giving my life to the Lord, um, after just major, major moments of like depression and darkness and questioning life, right? I ended up giving my life to Jesus. But I still had this feeling of like, but I still want to be with him. I still love him, right? And so I gave my life to the Lord. A couple months later, he's starting to come back into my life. How, this is how the enemy, as much as God is for us, the enemy is for us as well, right? He wants to rob us. And this guy comes back into my life and he's like, I made the biggest mistake. And I am so sorry. You're like the best thing that has ever happened to me. I love you. I love you. I love you. And I remember feeling, oh, yes, because I gave my life to the Lord and I prayed, God, please, please bring him back, bring him back, bring him back. And I felt weird I felt a release like that God was going to bring him back to me Mm. when I was praying it was such a peace that I felt but I it was the wrong way of viewing it he comes to my house and is like talks to my father Papa I I want your daughter like this was major mistake and I was so excited that he was in my house like oh my god I Jesus you're real Mm. Jesus, yay, you're giving me this, you're giving me the thing that I've wanted, you know, the thing that broke my heart and broke me. You're bringing it back to life. And I go into the living room to meet him. He he calls me down. I'm upstairs. He calls me down. He's like, hey, Stacey, can we talk outside? I'm like, yes, I'm so excited. He looks at me and he's like, I'm so sorry. And I, I want you back. Immediately, I had this like, burning sensation from the top of my head all the way down to the bottom and a loud no Mm. and I looked at him and I was like and I started laughing and I said you were just part of my story you're not coming with me wow I'm okay goodbye and he looked That's he was crazy. Like, what? And I'm like, I'm like, what? And I'm laughing. I'm laughing. I'm like, see you later. And I say peace to him. And I go into the house and I'm like, like nothing ever happened. And I'm like, wow. Thank you, Lord. What next? Wow. And it was just like, the Lord had this, he has this, he had this plan for me. And he's like, this can't go with you. Yeah. And I'm so happy that I recognized that. But the Lord needed to physically give me that moment. Right. You know, it's amazing that you recognized the Lord speaking to you in that moment and that you had the wherewithal and the commitment to obey. Instantly. Because you hadn't been saved that long, Mm -mm. you know, which I think is just a really amazing part of the testimony too. It's just, I think sometimes people think, oh, I, I can't wait till I get to the part where I'm like really hearing from the Lord. It's like, that can happen right away, dude. <laughs> you just gotta I, be listening. Absolutely. And then what are you gonna do when you do hear him? Absolutely. Can I share a story of when I heard Please. from the Lord and I didn't even know it was the Lord <laughs> until now because I'm well-versed in the, the things of the Lord. Yeah. Um. So just like I said, 
as much as God wants us, man, we have to recognize an enemy of our soul. Mm -hmm. There is an enemy to our soul. We can't just, you know, pray that away and hope the evil, bad stuff doesn't happen. No, it's going to happen, right? There is an enemy to our soul. And so I give, I give my life to the Lord. I say peace to this guy. Never thought about him again. Literally no feelings. You know how like you get the butterflies or the Mm -hmm. lump in your, it's like, Ah, it's gone. That's great. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Like that is a miracle to me for yeah. my life. It may sure. not mean something to someone else, but for me, God took that away because he's like, this, that's such a roadblock. I, I have something for you. Right. But I'm going to church. I'm always at church. The doors open. I'm like, I'm there <laughs> waiting outside. Like, uh, you know, like I'm in line at Pirates of the Caribbean at Disney. <laughs> just waiting, you know, to enter. And I'm always at church. I'm reading my Bible. I'm just, I'm so hungry. I'm, I'm like, yes, this feels, this, this feels great. And I have nobody, like I feel great. And yet I have nobody. Right. So I'm, I'm alone, but I'm not lonely. Makes sense. Right. Um, and so the enemy just knew what God, he knows what God can do. Right. And what can happen when a child of God says yes to him. Like, yes, I'm going to follow you, right? So I end up in this massive drama at church, right? And you know me, I hate drama. Like, <laughs> save it up for your mama. I ain't got time for that. I hate that stuff. There was a lot of jealousy that was happening because I was a new girl in church. Someone took interest in me. He had a girlfriend. I didn't know. It was just very perverted and just wasn't good the family of this girl grew up in the church and so they were ogs of the church and in their mind i was literally what they said a hoe that's coming to destroy oh, no. our family right if you don't know what a hoe is google <laughs> it <laughs> um and so i i'm going to youth youth was up to like 20 something years <laughs> old back then where was this? Do not South re- Florida Christian Life Center. Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes, in South Florida. Yeah, it was just not in South Florida. Um, so I'm like in love with God. I'm worshiping. I'm like raising my hands, looking like a total fool. And I go outside to my car because I left my Bible in my car, and so. Remember, I it was just me. Um, you hadn't made friends. I didn't or make. Yeah. I, I had no one. Right. I saw my husband. I he introduced himself to me and John. You know, a real good friend of ours, um, and a couple of people. But it wasn't like there was nothing there yet. And so I go outside to get my car, and I scoot my Newport my my pack of Newport cigarettes over. <laughs> God was working on me. Um, who? Smokes Newport. <laughs> so that's so 90s, right? <laughs> um, but I grabbed my Bible and I am met by the girl's mom, another cousin, and the dad kind of like to the side. And they just start going off on me, telling me, you better not go back into that church. You're not welcome here. Mm. And I was like, what are we doing? <laughs> What? I'm like, what, what's, why are, why are you so upset? You came in here. You are from the devil. You are a distraction to the men in here, to the young, to the young men in this church. Like it was just horrible. Wow. Um, and, she, and the girl was there with her arms crossed and doing one of these things. And she's like, you don't want to come back here. We do not want you here. And your youth pastor, which I love, shout out to Pastor Billy Cole. (laughs) I love him. He said, your youth pastor even told us that you are, you're a dirty hoe. And we don't like dirty hoes in church. And I was like. This cannot be true. This can be true. And um, yelling at me. Saying the F word at me. I didn't know what to do. But do what I usually do. I'm going to hurt you. Or I have to walk away from you. So I tried to walk away (laughs) so I don't get arrested. So I got in my car and I looked at them and I said, excuse me. I said, "Mm, you, I don't need you. And I don't need the pastor. I believe them for whatever reason. 
I don't need the pastor. I don't need this church. You can have it. And I got in my car and she slammed her hand on the, the um, front of my car. And I'm screaming. She's screaming. It was horrible. I drive off. And I just go home and I said, forget this. Right. That kind of church people is this. I light a cigarette and I just drive back to where I lived. And I know now that it was the Holy Spirit speaking to me because I heard this voice. And if you've never experienced it, or if you have experienced it, you know what I'm talking about. When you're quiet enough to hear, I heard a whisper, turn around. And I'm going crazy in my car because I'm talking to nobody. Mm. I'm like, I'm not turning around. Turn around. I'm not turning around. This blankety baby church. I knew it was a lie. I can't believe that. I'm screaming. Daughter, turn around. And so I t- I'm not turning around as I'm turning the car and I'm turning <laughs> the car. And I go back in the park and I'm mad. I walk into the church. Now church, the service is over. Mm. See my youth pastor. He looks like, he looked like Woody from Toy Story. <laughs> Dead serious. I love him so much. He's an incredible, he is the goat in my life. I see him walking and I was ready to tear him a new one. Like I just heard you talked about me and you called me some dirty hoe. And uh, so I'm walking ready to like throw hands as a gang member. And he looks at me and I'm like, I just heard that you were talking about me. And he grabbed my arm and he pulled me in the corner and he said, stop. Mm. And I'm like, Yes. <laughs> He's like, what is happening? I share with him what happened. He <laughs> tells me, you have a calling on your life and you don't know what that means yet, but you're going to remember this moment for the rest of your life. Wow. You need to stay here. You're not going anywhere. I will handle that family. In that moment, I felt so safe and protected. The thing that I've wanted for so long a man looked at me and said, I will handle that for you. Yeah. I will protect you. Just stay in the corner and be safe. I felt it. And it was like, oh, this is what it feels like to be loved by God and to be safe. Not that my pastor was a God, but the Lord was using this, right. this, this man to, sh- hey, there is a plan. And I, to this day, I remember these words. His words, you will remember this for the rest of your life. If I would have walked away, Brandon, I would not be here. Right. But I stayed. This is why I'm a huge on bloom where you're planted. Man, just stay. Even when it's hard, just stay. Mm. Just, just, just hold on, hold on, hold on. Right. Um, and I've, I've never looked back. I've, I've, you know, I visited that pastor a couple of years ago and I looked at him and my heart just always feels so warm. Like you with the pers- first person to ever really show me like tangible safety here on earth. And it was just, that's why he means so much to me. Anyway, yeah. I'll stop talking. No, that was <laughs> amazing. And I'm over here like, well, if you're watching this on YouTube, you're going to see. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here trying not to like sob into the microphone. It's so powerful. But these are just little things that happen right. that I was, uh, you can't, um, I can't deny it. So if I've ever, question the goodness of God. I can always go back to things in the past. Like I may not feel like you're good right now, but you have always proven to be good. Right. You really have. Right. You know, and also you did say that you would, you would squish the heads of my enemy. Yeah. And you have. Two things that stand out to me. Uh, One is when you prayed that the ex-boyfriend would come back to you. Mm -hmm. You just felt like, Lord was going to answer that prayer. Mm-hmm. You felt such a peace and you weren't wrong. I was it just wasn't wrong. for the reason you thought. Exactly. <laughs> that's so cool though. Yeah. I remember that's our phone ringing in the background. <laughs> Somebody get that please. Lord, <laughs> um, I remember kneeling down on my bed like this. Cause I, mm-hmm. that's, that's what you do. <laughs> Pray like this on your knees. Um, and, and I prayed and I begged and I had a tangible feeling. Like, oh. It's like, wow. You are, you are so good. And that really goes to show us like, even the things that we pray for, he knows how to answer them. 
Yeah. He knows what we need. We mm-hmm. may think we want something. We may think, well, I need you to answer it this way so I can feel it some type of way. And he's right. like, well, I'm going to answer it this way because I need you to be some type of way. I need you to be the person that I've called you to be. And it requires you letting this go. Right. And it re- it's all trust. Way. It's all trust. Yes. That's, I was going to say when dot, dot, dot. That's you don't need to say anything else. It's all trust <laughs> it's, all it's the all time. Trust. Everything that we're going through is working towards building that Absolutely. trust and faith in him. Um, the other thing that in two parts of the story that really stood out to me in relation to the story in John four, uh, the woman at the well, you didn't mention this on Sunday, but the part in the scripture, I, I know that you already know this, but she was going, he meet Jesus meets her at the well at noon. Mm hmm which is not the time that people came to draw water. That's the worst possible time. If you (laughs) live in the Middle East, I imagine to be going to a well. Um, So, and that speaks culturally, like even in her town where she lived, she was an outsider. So, you know, a lot of times there's an emphasis on the fact that she was a Samaritan and Jews didn't associate with Samaritans, um, which is all true too. But even within her own group of people, um, she was an outcast. And so- I hear that thread in your story as well, not feeling connected or your family throwing up their hands with you. Uh, even though you, you find this new space in church and there's a segment of that that turns against you and, and tries to emphasize you are an outsider here. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. And so the Lord met you, you know, in that, that space too. Yeah. Um, it, I mean, those things, those moments could have taken me out. Yeah. In the flesh, it could have taken me out. But I was so new and fresh and on a honeymoon, in a honeymoon stage with the Lord. I believe that I was so sensitive to his spirit and his voice. I didn't know that I was. Right. But I was so, huh, okay, this is a thing. Yeah. Like, why don't I feel as lonely and dark. Why do I feel like a darkness has lifted? I couldn't, I couldn't put that to words. I didn't know what that meant, but I knew like, I feel something happening in my life. Yeah. And it wasn't this like, you know, Ooh, these. (laughs) Just something uh, shifted. Witchcrafty (laughs) kind of stuff. It's just like, no, there was a, a shift of I feel safe and I don't know why yet. Mm-hmm. And I, I understand it now. And I understood it, you know, a year after me really giving my life to, you know, giving my life to the Lord. But, you know, there is something beautiful when you are in a relationship that is safe and the person protects you. And although um, we can experience a form of that love here on earth, it just will never compare to the perfect love that mm-hmm. God shows us. Right. And I experienced perfect love. So anything other than that is, was never going to work for me. Yeah. Like I, I, I experienced it and I still experience it to this day that even in my stupidity, mm-hmm. <laughs> even in my ridiculous ways, even in the things that I get into sometimes or the thoughts that I have, whatever, he's like, Hey, I will always meet you. I just need you to recognize me. I need you to look at me. Right. I'm right here. I've always been with you. Mm -hmm. I've always sat with you, even in the dark moments, even when you did not feel me, I was with you. I just need you to look at me. I just need you to trust me. And if you don't feel me, then I'm here. I'm with you. There's a plan and a purpose. You still have air in your lungs. I'm still going to use you. I'm still going to speak to you. I'm here. Mm -hmm. And I never had that. Right. I never had the, I'm here. I'm here. I don't care what you did. I'm here. I am here. And it's a beautiful feeling to know someone always has it. Like someone is, oh, you're, you're always there. Yeah. You and me. <laughs> you know, when you said um, that you were so, on, you were in the honeymoon phase. And so although those things could have taken you out, they didn't because you were still riding this mm-hmm. high of being in love and with the Lord, Mm -hmm. the honeymoon phase. And I guess that makes me think about um, 
that's why it's so important that we maintain that first love and that we nurture it because things are going to keep coming um, and they can take us out. Yeah. And we need to maintain that first love so that we remain sensitive to his voice. Yes. You know, um, so that we remember what he already did, you know, um, mm-hmm. when we were, we started this off talking about testimonies and how people like to tell their testimony in dramatic fashion sometimes, um, just to really emphasize how much God, power God has. <laughs> I was this bad. Um, what I don't hear a lot of is the testimonies that come after we're saved. Mm. Those we're not too excited to share those moments where we almost got taken out, you know? Um, and when people don't talk about that, mm-hmm. then people think other people think that that doesn't happen. Mm-hmm. And then what happens to them, they get taken out. Right. Yeah. And so I, I don't, I don't know if I'm making sense. It's you like, are. it's all to, tied together with this first love concept. And, you know, the idea that, this love that he has for us that we have the privilege of returning is primary yeah over it all yeah you know and when we have that love and that priority of Jesus to measure all things against man the perspective yeah yeah i'm going to this is not me saying my faith is perfect and it's been so great. This is just the reality that I have lived in. You have yours Mm -hmm. and I have my, my reality with the Lord, like what I've experienced with him. I have never once ever Renee thought about, walking away from him never once yeah um and i don't again i don't want to come off like okay she's just better than us or she's a pastor and she Mm -hmm. no no, i this is legitimately and it's because i know what it's like to not have it versus having it so i prefer to wrestle with him than to deny him Mm. That's good. So I have wrestled a lot in my faith. Why? Why has this been allowed? Or this is 10 years of me praying this and it feels like you've done nothing. I still am X, Y, Z, or this, this is still happening, whatever. But I rather wrestle with him than deny him. Yeah. I just, I, I rather be in that space. Because even in that space, it's still safe. Walking away is not safe. Right. It's not safe. So I I say that to encourage the people that have like these kind of low moments in their relationship that you don't have to walk away. You can wrestle with the Lord. Yeah. (laughs) Like you you can. He's, He's strong enough. (laughs) <laughs> so you can wrestle with the Lord and you know, I, you, you made sense a hundred percent and I wish people shared more their testimony after the fact of like staying in the tension with the Lord, waiting, being patient when he seems like he's, it, he's silent. Like, I wish I had that in my twenties because that could have helped me um, see him a little bit different and not pick up some lies along the way that I started believing about him. Right. That, oh, I already had my yay moment with him, so I'll never have that honeymoon stage again. Right. Which is a lie. (laughs) Yeah, I think sharing those, like you said, those moments where we wrestle and also the moments where we just flat out fail. Yeah. You know? Yes. And there's, the Bible has plenty to say about that. Ever heard of the prodigal son? Yep. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that's a thing. Yep. And it's okay for us to talk about it. Yes. But you were saying too about wrestling and and God 
being okay with that and welcoming that. And um, also I would encourage people, I, I think you would too, don't be afraid to bring somebody in Mm-mm. and to say, man, I'm, I'm struggling. I'm wrestling with the Lord right now. I don't get it. I'm flat out mad at him. <laughs> you know, whatever it is, yeah. we don't, it's a part of the Christian walk, Yeah, you know? And so to hide that away from people and not invite wise people <laughs> into that process with you to help you through it. Again, you talk about the enemy has a plan too. Isolation and separation is Absolutely. always up there at the top. Always. If he can keep us, hmm. he, he, he can win. Yeah. He can win some battles. And if he's won enough battles, he can win the war right. in our life. And I do not, I'm like, nah, I'm, there's way too many battles fighting before Jesus. I don't need that. Yeah. So I'd rather be <laughs> beat and broken and climbing <laughs> on the concrete towards Jesus than walking away from him. Right. Because I'm mad at him or he didn't, you know, I, and this is, this is why it's important to have an authentic encounter with the Lord. Mm. And not a forced one. Yeah. You know, um, you know, me telling everyone about Jesus, you know, about Jesus, you know, about Jesus, like you need to know about Jesus. You know, I was trying to force <laughs> Jesus down people's throat from a, it was, came from a good space. Right. Um, but the moment we realize, and we all need to realize that we cannot, um, that we were created to worship God whether we believe in him or not. And we will all come to a moment in our life where we say yes or no. Mm. You know? And so if you don't, if you don't know Jesus, (laughs) you're listening to this podcast and I pray in the name of Jesus that you would literally have a tangible experience right now Mm -hmm. as you are listening to these words that you that Jesus would sit with you right now and that you would recognize him and that you would you would accept him into your life as God you know and it's not there's no like you know tingles that are going to happen maybe you do feel that but maybe it's just acknowledging that you can no longer do this life without having that safe person with you Mm-hmm. That loving person. Yeah. So. Amen. Do you know Jesus? Do you have any more questions? No? Okay. She just looked <laughs> at me like. <laughs> don't, don't ask me that. <laughs> anyway, so, um, yeah, we can wrap this up. We love you guys. Again, like always, if you have any questions. Uh, or if you gave your life to Jesus. Yo, I hope you gave your life to Jesus immediately after I said that. Yeah. Because... Welcome to the fam, if that's what happened. I love you guys. Um, Next session, I don't know what it's going to be about, but it's going to be good. We love you guys. Say bye, Renee. Bye-bye.